All right then, so good afternoon, uh, Crisis Mappers, and uh, it's my great honor and pleasure to open the third international conference of Crisis Mappers. Thank you very much for being here and for contributing both your time and your expertise to ICCM 2011. This past year has been a rather challenging and busy year for all of us in the Crisis Mappers community. So the timing of this conference, as well as its location in the scenic city of Geneva, I think provides us with a perfect opportunity to pause and take a deep breath and gently reflect on the past 12 months. As many of you may already know, the Crisis Mappers community is an informal network of members who operate at the cutting edge of crisis mapping and humanitarian technology. We are not a formal entity. We have no office, no one location, no staff, and no core funding to speak of. And yet, over the past few years, more than 3,000 individuals representing over 1,500 organizations based in 140 countries have been joining this thriving and growing network. Some of you here today were also with us two years ago in Cleveland for ICCM 2009. This is where the Crisis Mappers community was launched. And we collectively founded this network for a very simple reason. To advance the study, the practice, and the impact of crisis mapping by catalyzing information sharing and forming new partnerships between our members. A lot has happened now since 2009, and that really is an understatement. Just take as a simple proxy the following figures. Shortly before ICCM 2009, I did a Google search of the term crisis mapping and got about 8,000 hits in return. Today, if you do a Google search of crisis mapping, the figure is beyond below, but over a quarter million hits, and the number is rapidly uh, growing. And this, I think, is a testament to the combined efforts uh, within this Crisis Mappers community, particularly the work that we've done in 2011. There indeed have been a number of really exciting new developments in crisis mapping, humanitarian technology writ large. And I was hoping to cite a few here, but there are so many that during my short introductory remarks, uh, I can't really do justice to all of them. So instead, I invite you to visit the Crisis Mappers website, where you'll see the full list of the project that you yourselves have ranked as the most important crisis mapping projects for 2011. You'll see and hear about a number of these projects over the next two days, either featured as Ignite Talks or during the demos at the technology fair, the poster session, and indeed also tomorrow, where we have our self-organized sessions. So in addition to these uh, fine projects, there have been a number of important recurring themes that have emerged over the past year. And I'd like to take just a few minutes to briefly touch on just five of those themes as a way to inform some of our conversations for the next two days. The first is validation. We need to better assess our own work. More specifically, we need to have independent experts who specialize in monitoring and evaluation to assess the crisis mapping deployments that we are involved in. So I urge our donors, many of whom, many of you are here today, to provide the necessary funding for this to happen and to make it a requirement to all your grantees that their crisis mapping deployments be assessed and evaluated so that we can do a better job going into 2012 to validate the field of crisis mapping. The second is security. Now, we all know that the vast majority of these crisis mapping platforms and the technologies that they integrate were not designed for use in highly hostile environments. At the same time, the field of computer security is a highly specialized one. 
and we're in serious need for these experts to provide us with direct support at the coding level in order to resolve and address some of these outstanding security risks. Talking is important. We should be discussing these risks. But coding at this point is even more important. Members of this network who are security experts already know what needs to be done. So let's get that coding done. What we do need to talk about is developing a clear and well-defined set of guidelines on how to use crowdsourced data from conflict zones. We urgently need a code of conduct, that one that hopefully can be endorsed by an established uh, and credible organization to hold ourselves accountable moving forward. Namely, how do we use this data? What are the ethical implications of this data? How do we uphold the do no harm principle? The third uh, theme that I want to highlight is the key consolidation of partnerships between the formal humanitarian organizations, many of them represented here today, and the many informal new volunteer networks that have been springing up over the past few years. We began this conversation together last year, so exactly 12 months ago, at ICCM 2010. And a considerable amount of time and energy has been put into developing the initial scaffolding necessary to wire these partnerships. But we still have a lot of work to do. These partnerships are not going to become any less critical in 2012, so we need to put in place these collaboration mechanisms earlier rather than later. And one way, one important way to do this, to ensure that the protocols and the workflows that we put in place, that they are appropriate, flexible, but robust, is by working together in joint crisis response simulations and disaster simulation exercises. The fourth theme I'd like to bring to your attention has to do with scaling. And there are a number of action items within this particular theme that I think deserve some of our attention for the next two days. One of them has to do with data licensing, specifically around the issue of satellite imagery. We need to find a better way to share this information and the data derived from satellite imagery across and between members of this community if we really want to scale and replicate what we've done already in Haiti and in other countries. There are two other points about scaling. They're combined in many ways. We are increasingly needing micro-tasking platforms as well as automated filtering algorithms to scale our crisis mapping platforms and efforts. In terms of the filtering, we really need some flexible natural language processing algorithms that allow us to aggregate and verify, triangulate, filter a large volume of social media data as well as text messages, and to do this in real time, not three days later, but in real time. Now, these solutions already exist in the private sector, and they increasingly begin to surface uh, in the field of public health. But until today, st I think that many of our members are either not aware of these tools, they don't know how to use them, they are, or these tools are simply not accessible to them. And this really needs to change, because this is going to be core to our success in scaling our efforts in 2012. So I hope that those who are here today focusing on natural language processing, on microtasking, on resolving the satellite data licensing issues, continue your work and uh, give it an extra push in the next few months, and then share this with the rest of the community. The fifth and final uh, theme that I just wanted to highlight is mainstreaming crisis mapping, which is the topic of this year's international conference. Our excellent co-hosts, uh, the JRC, Joint Research Center, and ICT for Peace, are going to be speaking to this very theme for their keynote address, so I won't say any more right now, but I'll hand it over to my colleague, good friend, and fellow co-founder, Dr. Jem Jen Zemke, to uh, tell you a bit more about our co-hosts and what to expect over the next two days. Thank you very much. <laughs>